right here. We are recording. So today we're going to begin. Uh, we're going to begin uh, trying to understand the issue of monetary policy. Okay. So let me share the screen. Share. For some reason, uh, today is chapter thirteen in macro. Okay. Let's see if it appears. Okay. We're going to begin to try to understand how money actually functions in the economy. We're going to try to understand uh, the role that banks play in the economy. We're going to try to understand how banks inter in interlink with the government to try to control the amount of money in the economy. How banks actually create money and then how money actually multiplies in the economy. Okay. So specifically, we're going to try to understand what is the role that money plays in the economy. So let me begin by asking you a question. If I was to ask you, give me a definition of what money is, what would you tell me? If I was to ask you, give me a definition of what money is, what would be your answer? What is money to you? Um, Anybody? I'd probably say currency that possesses economic value. But that's okay, so you'll though. think that uh, money is currency? Okay. Are you ever going to Walmart and pay with your debit card? Are you ever going to Walmart and pay with a check? Okay. Yes. Have you ever paid someplace by doing a transfer? You know, wire transfer? You know, have you ever sent money to someone else in another country? You know, by using one of these agencies that can actually transfer money you money for you? Okay. So what I'm trying to tell you is that money is more than what we think it is. So money has a very simple definition. This is what money is. Money is anything that is accepted as a form of payment. Okay. Anything of value that can be used as a form of payment, you know, you know, is, is serving the same functions of what money is. If you remember in history in the United States, when our nation was actually created, most individuals used to pay each other with uh, tobacco, right? They used to pay each other with a specific, uh, I guess, commodities, right? So that's what money is, right? So then what is money? Who creates the money? Okay, so today, money is actually a tool that we have created that simplifies market transactions. So money is something that we have created that simplify market transactions. Now think about this. What would be the situation if there was no money? If there was no money. Now let's assume, for example, you know, uh, I am a farmer and I have cows. You know, and Cliff Jones is another farmer that lives next to my farm, but he raises chickens. Right? And then uh, I go to Cliff and I say, hey Cliff, you know. I can give you a gallon of milk and you give me two dozen eggs. And Cliff will come to me and say, well, actually I have a cow too, so I don't need your milk, but I need the eggs. And Cliff said, well, yeah, I know you need my eggs, but I don't need milk. What I actually want is cucumbers. So then I have to go and find somebody out there that has cucumbers that will be willing to trade that cucumbers for my milk and then come back to Cliff to be able to give him the cucumbers to be able to get my eggs. So as you can see, in the past, we used to do transactions like that by bartering. But for bartering to actually work, they have to exist the double coincidence of ones, which simply means by coincidence, you have to want what I have, and, I have, and you have to have what I want. But if you have something that I want, but you don't need what I have, then that creates a problem. So as you can see, then by having money, money has actually eliminated this. So money actually helps us and actually have transactions because money is something of value that we can actually receive. And I know that someone else by faith is going to receive it as a form of payment. So then the question is what gives value to money? Well, what gives value to money is the knowledge that we know that someone else is going to accept it as a form of payment. Think about this, why you don't want Mexican pesos? Well, you don't want Mexican pesos because you don't know who will be willing to accept those Mexican pesos as a form of payments. 
Now, people in Mexico have no problem. They want Mexican pesos because they know somebody in Mexico is going to be willing to accept that currency as a form of payment, right? So that's what money is, right? Again, if there was no money, transactions would be made using a barter system, right? The direct exchange of something, you know, instead of money, if there was no money. So then today, money acts as a medium of exchange. You know that sellers are going to accept payment for goods and services. So then what is the definition of money? See, money is anything accepted as a medium of exchange. Anything that people are willing to accept that can be used as money. You know, in the United States, like I say, we used to pay with tobacco. It was not uncommon. It was not uncommon at the beginning of, the, uh, of our nations in the 1700s, early 1800s, to have a young man, you know, in Baltimore, right there where the chips were coming from England, with a lot full of tobacco to pay, you know, because they had just delivered his wife from, from England. You know, they were paying for the transportation of families with tobacco to these uh, captains. The captain would bring the family from England and in return, the captain would go back to England or Europe with tobacco. You know, so as you can see, then money is anything accepted as a form of payment. So then what is the function that money actually serves? Okay, put this in, in your notes, or oh, this is important for you to know. Uh, money serves as a medium of exchange. In other words, we can use that to payment. Money also serves as a store of value, right? In other words, I go and do something for you, you pay me for my work, and that money that you gave me, I can save it, and I don't have to spend it today. I can use it in the future. It's something of value that I can use in the future. So then money serves as a store of value. Uh, and also, we can use money to measure things. We can use money to measure, it's a yardstick, to measure the price of things. Look, if I was to ask you a question, for example, what is more valuable, a glass of, uh, I guess, a, a bottle of Jack Daniels or a Bible? What is more valuable, a bottle of Jack Daniels or a Bible? Tell me, guys. Okay. By the way, I have both of them here. I'm sorry, not a Jack Daniels. <laughs> I have a bottle of water. Yeah, yeah, I don't have Jack Daniels. A bottle of water that represents the Jack Daniels, and I have a real Bible. And by the way, this is my Bible. It's not only a Bible. You get my joke? Anybody get my joke? This is my Bible, not just a Bible. Nobody gets my joke? Are you following the news? What happened yesterday uh, when uh, in Washington DC, when the president was upset because they find out that he went into the, into the shelter and he wanted to show that he was not afraid. Nobody has been following the news? The Didn't he go, he like went to some church in the area and then he held up a Bible and took a bunch of photos with it. Okay, he wanted to take a picture in front of our church and there were a couple of thousands of protesters there they were just there. They were not making anything. They were like passive protesters. And to open the road for the president to walk, they actually uh, threw, uh, what's called those gases, uh, tear gases, you know, and some bullets to open for the president to go there, to go take a, what, a picture with a Bible, right? And they asked him, is that your Bible? And his answer was, it's a Bible. You know, so it's a joke. It's a joke. By the way, I'm saying this because this is very controversial because many people are complaining that, you know, of, of that action, was that a, a photo opportunity or was he really wanted to show there that he's going to pray, you know? So it's, that's my joke. So coming back to my class, what is more valuable then? A bottle of Jack Daniels or a Bible? We as Christians say, well, of course, a Bible is more valuable than a Jack Daniels. Okay, so if a Bible is more valuable than a Jack of Daniels, how many of you have ever received a bottle of Jack Daniels for free? And the answer is never, right? How many of you have received Bibles for free? Many of you. So then who determines the value of an item? See, we as a society working together measure things and we say, this is the value of this item. So then we use money to assign values. We use money as a yardstick, right? Again, so then the functions of money is to serve as a medium of exchange, 
a store of value in as a standard, I'm sorry, a store of value is a standard of value. Okay, so then the question is, so what is money? How does money look like? Well, you know what money is. You know, money in, for us is cash, right? And cash actually fills all these purposes. We can use cash to make transactions, we can use cash to measure, and we can use cash to save for, pre, for future consumptions. Now, checking accounts serve almost like money. They act like money, right? But they are not money. See, think about it. debit cards act like a check, and a check is a check, and they act like money, but it is not money. And let me explain why this is not money. For example, with my debit card, I can go and make purchases, but only if what? That transaction will be approved only if I have what? Money in my checking account. My checking, my check is going to be a pay only if I have money in my actual checking account at the bank. In other words, if I can write you a check for a million dollars, that would be no problem. I can write you a check for a million dollars today if you want to, right? When you go to the bank and you're not going to, you're not going to get a cent, right? Well, because Hassel only has $29 in his account. Are you with me? So what I'm trying to tell you is just because something acts like money, that does not mean that it is money. So money is something that we can actually use out there to do the actual transaction. Think about online payment, the same story, right? So this is what money is. So then in essence, money is not a physical form. Now, because money can be a transfer of an electronic signal. Think about this. Let's say, for example, if I have a friend, you know, in South America and he say, hey, how so, you know, can you let me, you know, 200 bucks? I say, yeah, that'll be no problem. Let me go ahead and wire you the $200. You know, I can go to a bank and say, I want to wire to my friend $200. Or oh, today, I don't even have to do that. I can transfer $200 through my PayPal, PayPal account, I believe. And or I can transfer $200 with, what is some of the payment, the Mo, what's called the application that you use to pay? Venmo and Cash App. Okay, Cash Out and PayMall and all that stuff. So as you can see, this is electronic. Yeah, I don't know what it is. These are electronic signals. You transfer your money from one person to the other. Okay, in the United States, we classify money in two categories, right? It's either we classify them as S1, M1, or M2, okay? So we classify money as M1 or M2, okay? So let me explain the difference between one and the other. And again, very, very easy to understand. Okay, in the United States, money is classified in two different categories, either as M1 or M2. M1 is actual cash or money that we have in checking accounts, okay? In other words, it's money that we can use to make immediate transactions. We can use that to pay. M2 is money that we have in savings accounts. It is money that we cannot use to make transactions. For example, you go and open a savings account, you, know, you have a, a certificate or you have a, a deposit or you have a, a way of saying, yes, this guy has, let's say, $600 on his savings account. I mean, I cannot go to McDonald's and say, let me have a, you know, a Big Mac and a quarter pound of cheese and a quarter pound of cheese and can you please withdraw this from my savings accounts? In other words, they are not going to accept the money in my savings account as a payment. They're going to tell me, go out and get cash or transfer your money from your savings account to your checking account so you'll be able to pay me with your debit card. So then M2 is money, but it's not money that we can use to do, to do transactions, right? So then M1 is the actual cash or currency that we use to make transactions, okay? So again, there's two classifications of money. By the way, there are more classifications of money, but for this class, this is a, just an introduction to economics. We're just going to call it M1 and M2. Actually, we have like M1, money that we use to make transactions. M2, money in savings accounts. M3, money in uh, savings accounts in more than $10,000, up to, I believe, a million dollars. And then we have what's called L money, L, like a loser. L money is money that is in accounts of more than $10 million that people usually don't touch that, okay? But for this class, we simply call it M1 and M2. M1 is money that we use to make transactions, and M2 is money that we that we cannot use to make transactions. It's money that we have, 
but it's actually in savings accounts, okay? So coming back, then this is uh, what we understand. So M1 is cash and transaction accounts. What is transaction accounts? Transaction accounts is checking accounts, right? It's money that we use to make transactions, okay? Uh, so M2 is actually M1 plus savings accounts. So then M2 is all the money that we have in M1 plus all the money that we have in savings accounts. Now, from an economic point of view, we are more concerned about the amount of money in M1. So when we track money in the economy, we are concerned about M1. Now, why M1? Well, because M1 is the money that we use to make transactions. So if we look at the amount of money in the economy, look at the composition of money in the economy. About $1.2 billion is the actual money in cash. Think about it. This is very insignificant compared with the size of the economy, with the size of the money that we have. And about $1.6 billion is the amount of money that we have in checking accounts. So together it's close to $3 billion. We have about $3 billion in money that we can use to make transactions. But look at the total composition of money. We have about $11 billion in money in the economy. And out of this, about $8 billion in the savings accounts. And about other $582 billion is money that we have in, in invested in other type of investments, such as uh, money market accounts, mutual funds, and things like that. Okay? So again, when we follow money in the economy from an economic point of view, economist point of view, we are concerned about M1. Why M1? Because this is the money that we use to make transactions. And remember, in the economy, we're looking about what the economy is doing and how we can do or what we need to do to be able to stimulate the economy. Remember, like if the economy is in a recession, what do we do in fiscal policy when the economy is in a recession? According to Keynes, what do we need to do when the economy is in a recession? You were just tested on that yesterday, guys. Increase government purchases, increase transfer payment, and decrease taxes. Exactly. So we do that. So something else that we can do to stimulate the economy is to actually increase the amount of money in the economy. So, and we hope that this money that we give to individuals, these individuals are not going to put it in the savings account. We hope that these individuals are going to put their money in their checking accounts and they're going to spend it. Because by doing that, what we're trying to do is change the aggregate demand, right? Remember, aggregate demand equals to C plus I plus G. So what we want to do is consumption to go up, okay? So again, so then the amount of money available in the economy affects consumers' ability to buy. So then money directly, directly affects the aggregate demand, okay? So now let's try to figure out the relationship between actual money and banks, okay? So in the United States, we have a very unique banking system. We call it a, fric a frictional banking system. And what that means is that in the United States, banks play a big role on how money you know, affects economic outcomes because banks have the ability to create money. Now, think about this. On a typical bank, I don't care which bank it is, let's call it Bank of Cleveland. On the Bank of Cleveland, Let's assume, that you, let's assume that you receive a, a $1,000 check. So you're gonna go ahead and put that on your account. I don't care if it's your savings account or your checking account, you're going to go put your money in, your, in the bank. So you go ahead and put $1,000. As you can see, once you put those $1,000 at the bank, that becomes a liability to a bank, a liability, okay? So then the Bank of Cleveland has a liability of $1,000 that he, they owe to somebody else. So Total liabilities for the bank at this point is $1,000. Let's assume that that's all they have. Now, what does the bank do with money that you put at the bank? How do banks make money? Do banks make money by storing your money in a warehouse? And the answer is no. Banks make money by making loans. And they make loans from the amount of money they have received in deposits. Right? So then what a bank will do as soon as you deposit your money at the bank, by law, the bank has to keep a required reserve. They have to keep X amount of money on reserves. In other words, they cannot touch it. 
So for simplicity, let's say it's 10%. So then the bank has to keep $100 in required reserves. So at this point, the bank has $900 in excess reserves. In other words, they have $900 in excess of what they are required. So then as you can see, the total assets for the bank, now they're also $1,000. Liabilities and assets are the same. Now, a bank is going to try to change this excess reserve into loans because that's where banks make money. Right? So Zach goes to the bank and says, okay, I want to borrow $900 because I'm going to buy me a top-of-the-line mountain bike. Right? So the bank lends Zach a loan for $900. So as you can see, the assets have not changed. The liabilities have not changed. So Zach goes out there and purchases a mountain bike. I don't know, a used one or a new one. doesn't really matter. Now, the seller of this bike, now he has $900. And most people go to the bank and deposit their money. So then this guy is going to come to the bank and deposit now his $900. Hold on for a second. Okay, so now he has $900. My apologies. I thought there was somebody was asking me a question. Okay, so then the bank received this deposit for $900. Right? It can be this bank or it can be another bank. It doesn't really matter. So now that the liabilities for this bank increase to $1,900, now what do the bank has to do out of this new deposit? Well, by law, this bank have to now keep now $90 in reserves. They just receive a $900 deposit. So then they have $810 to lend. And then they go out and make these loans. So now look at the power of banks. Look at the power of banks. You go to the bank. Deposit $1,000. By law, the required reserve ratio, let's say, is 10%. So that means that the bank has to keep 10% of that in reserve. They cannot touch it. So the bank will keep $100 in reserves, and now they have $900 they will be able to lend. They lend this money. It goes out in the economy. Eventually, this money comes to a bank. By law, the bank has to keep 10% of that, $90. So now they have $810 to lend. Right? The bank lends this $810, it goes back into the economy, eventually it comes to the bank. Once the deposit is made, the bank has to keep 10% of that, which will be what? $81. Right? Somebody has a calculator that you can help me? Okay. So, uh, 18 minus 81, now the bank has? 729. 720 what? I didn't hear you. 729. Okay, 729. So then that money goes into the economy, comes to the bank, then the bank has to keep 7290, 10% of that. And the bank now has how much money in excess reserves? What is 90% of 729? Go ahead. Okay, you see, what is 90% of 729? 65610. 65610, right? And then the bank has that amount of money, makes a loan, and now the bank has to put, has to put 6560 on reserves, and now the bank has, how much is 90% of that? 59049. 59049, and so, so as you can see, run after run after run after run after run. Look at the amount of loans the bank was able to generate with a $1,000 deposit. Look at the amount of loans, 900, 18, 729, 659, 590, you know, another 545, 4 something, blah, 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 blah. How much, how much loans was this bank able to generate? How much money did they create it? It's a very simple formula, and this is the money multiplier. It is one divided by the required reserve ratio. So in this case, how much is the required reserve ratio? 10%, so it would be 1 divided by 0 0.10 equals to 10. So it's 10 times. The bank can make 10 times in loans on the amount they receive in deposits. So then this bank is going to be able to generate $10,000 in loans. Now do you know why banks love for you to open a checking account or a savings account? Right? And that's why banks try to, to motivate you to make deposits. 
because every time you put your money in the bank, the bank is very happy because they're going to be able to lend that money to someone else, right? And then they're going to make interest based on that, or they're going to make money. So as you can see, then banks have a power of creating money. Now think about this. I go to the bank and I say, I want to borrow $900. The bank say, okay, let me go ahead and do you have an account with us? And if you don't have an account with them, they're going to say, we want you to open an account with us. And you open an account with them. And then what the bank is going to say is, here's your $900. No, that's not what the bank will say. The bank say, let me go ahead and deposit this money on your account. Boom. By a click of a mouse, click, they put $900 on your account. Right? Then you go out and spend the money. The money comes back to the bank. Then the bank say to somebody else, oh, okay, let me give you another loan and click. By a month of a, by a click of a mouse, the bank is able to generate another loan. So the question is, how, many, how much money do the bank lend after this initial deposit of $1,000? $10,000. They lend $10,000. Where did that money came from? I mean, where's the actual cash? Where's the money? And as you can see, this is nothing more than more or less what we call it a phantom money. It's money that we created out of a click of a mouse. So then banks have a humongous amount of power in the economy, and that's, they have the power to create money. So now, how about if we change the required reserve? That instead of 10%, the required reserve will be 5%. So it'll be one divided by 0.05. So now banks will be able to generate loans of 20 times the amount of money that they receive in deposits, okay? So if somebody goes to the bank and deposit $10,000 and the required reserve is 0.05, it will be one divided by 0.05 equals to 20. So 20 times 10 is what? 200,000? Is that right? 10,000 times 20? Okay, so the bank will be able to generate $200,000 in loans with a simple deposit of $10,000. Would you like to guess what is the actual required reserve ratio? How much do banks have to keep in reserves? Out of every money that individuals put? It's actually 3% on the average. So how much is the multiplier? Thirty-three times. So if you go to the bank and deposit your stimulus checks of twelve hundred dollars, the bank is very happy because with that twelve hundred dollars, somebody help me with a calculator. Twelve hundred times thirty-three the bank will be able to generate 39,600. They can lend you, well, not you, but different groups of people, up to amount of $39,600 in loans. Okay? But now, think about these guys. Now, let's go the other way around. I went to the bank and I put $1,000. In the original 10% requirement, the bank put $100 in reserve. That's my money. Then somebody came to the bank and deposited $900. And the bank only has $90 of that. $810, the bank only has $81. $729, the bank only has $72. Out of $656, the bank only has $65. So what will happen if me, you, the other guy, and the other guy, we go at the bank at the same time and we say, hey, I want my money. Well, what do you think is going to happen? The bank is going to be in real trouble because the money is not there. So in the United States, we have a fra uh, fractional banking system, which simply means we have a glass, a, a, a structure made out of glass that as long as nobody throws a rock, we'll be okay. But if somebody throws the rock, the building is going to collapse. 
In the 1929s, 1930s, the Great Depression, people became afraid of banks and they went to the bank and said, I want to withdraw my money. And then somebody else went and that create, the bank told the people, well, I don't have your money, come back tomorrow. And that created panic among people. And when it created a panic among people, that created a run, which means that everybody run to the bank and say, I want to withdraw my money. And banks did not have the money. And people did like what every normal person will do. They will burn the banks. Literally, they burn the banks. I want my money. I want my money. You cannot keep my money. And the bank did not have the money. So they literally begin to burn the buildings. So now in the United States, that's why we have fooled people by putting a big sign at the entrance of every bank that say, your money is insured by the FDIC up to, what is it now, $250,000? Your money is insured up to $250,000. Who's insuring that? It's a government agency. Did that agency actually have the money to pay the money for the depositors? And the answer is no. What do you simply base on the faith that, hey, don't worry about it, right? Your money is insured. The government is going to pay back your money if for some reason the bank cannot pay you your money. Okay? And again, this is the system that we have in the United States. Questions? Okay, so let's continue with a bank, okay? So every time a bank makes a loan, right? Actually what the bank is doing, as you can see right here, is creating money. So then with a few keystrokes, the bank can actually increase the amount of money in the economy. Now, this ability to create money is limited by the Fed. The Fed is the federal, um, the federal system, the, the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve Bank controls the, uh, the, the banks. So then by controlling the required reserves, you know, controlling the, how much money a bank has to keep at hand, then, then the bank ability to make loans is actually altered. Because, for example, if the Fed say, let's increase the required reserve to 50%, then banks only have 50% to lend of whatever they receive, right? So then by increasing the required reserves, banks have less power to make money. And again, you know what a reserve is? Each bank must maintain a required reserve. It's the minimum amount of money that you have to hold. You cannot touch this, right? And again, the required reserve ratio is the is the ratio of a bank's required reserves to its total deposits, and that's established by the Fed, right? So then if I go to a bank and deposit $100, and the required reserve is 10%, then by law, that bank has to keep 100, I'm sorry, $10 in required reserves. And then the extra becomes excess reserves. And like I told you, banks don't make money by keeping excess reserves. So banks will always try to change these excess reserves into loans as soon as possible, okay? So then if banks make a loan and they're actually creating money, the borrowers spend the money, the seller deposits it into a company's bank, and then this bank has now more excess reserves. And then the bank makes another loan. You know, when the borrowers spend this money, eventually this money comes to a bank, and then this begin to repeat again over and over again. It's a multiplier effect. Right? It's a process that takes place. Right? Again. So then money multiplier is the amount of deposit dollars that the bank system can create from a one dollar excess in reserves. So keep in mind, banks can only make loans from excess reserves. Only from excess reserves. Not from required reserves. So again, excess reserves times the money multiplier is the potential deposit creation. So then let me make a correction on what I was just telling you. So I was telling you this. When I went to the bank and deposited $1,000, and the required reserve ratio is uh, 10%, I told you the bank will be able to generate $10,000 in loans. Right? And actually that is wrong because the bank will only be able to lend money out of the excess reserves. So then what is the initial excess reserve out of the $1,000? The initial excess reserve is 900, okay? So it'll be 900 times 10 will be $9,000. 
Okay. Again, money will multiply based on the multiplier times the excess reserves. Okay. So coming back to this, then let's continue with the chapter. So then if the recovery share ratio is 20, then the money multiplier is five. I already told you how do we do that. Very simple, right? It's just simply one divided by the required reserve. So if the bank has no excess reserve, then the bank cannot make any loans. Okay, again, we already discussed this. All right. So then the, 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 the essential functions of a bank is actually the ability to be able to create loans based on the deposits they receive. So then every time a bank makes a loan, what they're actually doing, they're actually changing the money supply in the economy. And the money supply in the economy is going to increase the amount of money in the hands of individuals, right? And these individuals are going to now consume more, okay? And again, you don't have to know this. Uh, the question is, okay, so what are some of the things that can actually take some of this power out of banks? Well, how about if people don't deposit money at the banks, right? If people don't deposit money at the banks, then banks have no power to be able to make loans, right? What else can constrain the power of a bank? Well, how about if banks simply decide not to lend? They are afraid that individuals are not going to be able to pay them back, right? So then that has a constraint on the amount of money in the economy. Or how about if banks want to lend a lot of money, but people don't want to borrow money? That's what is happening today. See, banks have excess reserves. In other words, a lot of people now are saving money because they are afraid of what's going to happen. Now, every time you open a savings account, the bank is going to have to pay you interest rate on that deposit. So there's no way the bank will be able to continue paying you interest rates without them receiving some type of revenue. So they are desperately trying to lend your money to someone else. Now, but there's not a lot of people in the market to borrow money to buy houses or to buy cars. So as a result of this, then that's why the money supply have not expanded in the economy because people are not borrowing. In addition to that, then the power of the banks to make money can be constrained by regulation. The question is who controls the amount of money in the economy, who controls the banks, and that's the Federal Reserve Bank. And that's the next chapter that we're going to be covering. By the way, today we're going to be covering two chapters because the only lectures that we have is actually today, today's Tuesday and tomorrow Wednesday, because we have presentations on Thursday, right? So uh, we're gonna be covering two chapters. By the way, this is the end of the chapter, see? Application, for, so we have finished chapter 13 at this point, which is banks. So now we're going to begin and try to understand who controls the banks, who controls the banks? And that's chapter 14. They're actually together. In, in the past, these chapters used to be one chapter, now we divide it into two chapters. So any questions, any questions, about banks. No? Okay, perfect. So let's stop right here. We have finished chapter 13. Let's recording. Okay, so now we're going to jump into chapter uh, 14 and we're going to try to understand who regulates the banks in the United States. In, in the United States, we have a Federal Reserve Banking System. And let me explain this in, in different ways. Most nations of the world have a national bank that controls all the banking activities. You go for England, for example, you have the National Bank of England, the National Bank of France, German National Bank, Banco Nacional de Mexico, Banco Nacional de Argentina, National Bank of the Bahamas, National Bank of India, National Bank of China, which simply means we have a one bank that is imposed by the government and this bank controls all the amount of money in the economy, okay? One national bank. The United States is the only nation in the world that do not have a national bank. In the United States, we have a system of banks that act like a national bank. And we call this the Federal Reserve Banking System. The Federal Reserve Banking Systems. Now I'm gonna give you a little bit about history about how all this begin and then jump into what they do now. Okay, as you already know, historically, when this nation was created, the states or the colonies want autonomy. 
they wanted to make their own decisions and they did not want a government to be over them, right? So as a result of this, they were afraid that if we create a national bank, this national bank was going to control all the economic activities of the colonies. So the colonies said, forget about it. We don't need a national bank. We're going to have our own little banks in each colony, in each state. So for many years, you know, this is the way we used to, be, we used to have a system. It was, we have state banking, state banking, state banking, and we did not allow banks to actually move into, into another place. Okay? So we were working like that. However, by the 1913s, something began to happen in our nation. And what happened in our nation was, for the first time, individuals were actually beginning to move from one place to the other. In other words, geographical mobility in the United States did not occur until the beginning of this century. Right? It wasn't in the 1904, 1905, when people begin to move to other places in large numbers. Of course, we have migrations. You know, before that, you know, people going to the West, you know, to Montana, to California. Uh, but it was not like the numbers that begin to happen in the 1905, 1906. And that was as a result of now having automobiles and the train system and things like that. So people were beginning to move. So this was creating some problems for banks because this is what will happen. Think about this. Let's assume that a bank or an individual in Baltimore, you know, uh, he has been working in Baltimore at the, you know, at the chips right there, and he has $600. So let's go back to 1900. So he had $600 in his savings account. So now he was going to move, let's say, to San Francisco because somebody told him, hey, you can find a job over here that pays better. So the guy had two choices. The guy can go to the bank and say, I want my money. But during those times, you know, uh, individuals prefer in many cases to have gold and silver as a form of payment. We still pay with gold and silver. So the individual will say, okay, I don't want to carry all this cash, or all this gold and silver with me because I'm afraid somebody's going to steal it. So they'll come to the bank and say, can you just give me a note that say that I have $600 worth of gold in this bank? So the bank will write them a note and that individual will get a note and it will be easy for this individual just simply to hide the note, you know, on his pocket and travel to California. And once he arrived in California, he will go and try to buy, let's say, a little store or something and say, okay, I want to pay you. And this is a check that I have from a bank of Baltimore. Well, the banker in San Francisco said, well, how do I know that this is actually what? It's actually true. Right? So it was difficult for a bank to know if that money actually existed. Remember, we still, you know, the modes of communication were still in their infancy. So we had to go with the little thing, 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 thing. What's it called? The... the Somebody help me? Cassie, what's it called? The way we used to communicate like, before the phone? Like the telegram? The or telegram. Yeah, with the telegram, trying to check the bank, you know, to see if this bank actually had the money that this guy say he actually had. So it, it was a nightmare for banks and for individuals to be able to move from one place to the other and pay with checks. So then, uh, then that was in, like in, in the 1900s. 19, uh, then by 1907, 1909, there was a fear in our nation in which people became afraid of banks. This was before the Great Depression. And people begin to go to banks and say, I want to withdraw my money. I want to withdraw my money. So banks did not have the money because they have lent the money to somebody else. So then bankers were having difficulties. So bankers came up with the idea and said, wouldn't it be nice if we can create like a national bank, a bank that will lend money to banks? Right? In other words, the government to lend money to, 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 the, to the banks. So they come up with a scheme and all the bankers, actually uh, the seven most powerful families in the United States that own most of the banks at that point, decide to have a meeting in Chekhol Island, Georgia, right? The island of Chekhol Island in Georgia. And seven individuals, these are the seven most powerful families, the Baltimores, the uh, Rockefellers, the uh, uh, give me names of families that you know at the beginning of the century, the Melons, the, uh, anybody else? Rockefellers, Melons. Uh, Baltimore, uh, any other families that you can think? Was there here, Carnegie? Sir. What was that, sir? Carnegie. Smith? Hagen, Vanderbilt. yeah. Vanderbilt. So all these families that almost of the banks decide to have a meeting in Georgia. And in that meeting, they invited a couple of individuals from Congress. They actually meet there on the, a, a, we are there for a hunting meeting you know where they didn't want people to know what was going on so they all meet there on their hunting season hunt, they were going to be hunting for dogs according to this meeting they invited a couple of congressmen and you know after a couple of bottles of wines and they all got drunk they all came up with the idea that it would be a great idea if we can create a national bank or a bank that will be able to help the banks 
So they sold the idea to these congressmen that were there in that meeting, and then these congressmen went you know, to Washington, and they began to present the idea that it would be a good idea to divide the nations into a region and create a bank in that region, and that bank was with the only purpose of being able to help banks in case of need. So then this is what they end up with, okay? They decide to divide the nations geographically, and they divide the nations into regions, and in each region, they decide to put a bank. And as you can see, most of the banks that we have now, these are the 12 federal short bank banks, the members of the 12 federal banks, uh, they put one in Boston, number two in New York, number three, Philadelphia, number four, Cleveland, Ohio, five is Richmond, Virginia, six is Atlanta, Georgia, number seven is Chicago, eight is St. Louis, Missouri, uh, nine is uh, Minneapolis, and then we have uh, 10, Can uh, what is that? Kansas City, uh, Dallas, Texas, number 11, and San Francisco's number 12. So as you can see, most of the banks that were created, they're actually in the eastern part of the United States. And you have to understand this because most of the economic activity of our nation at that point was actually in the eastern part of the country. As a matter of fact, things have not changed now, guys. Things have not changed. Uh, and let me explain what, what I mean by things have not changed. If you go to Cleveland, Tennessee, and you do go around, create a circle of 600 miles around Cleveland, from Cleveland, Tennessee, 600 miles around, 70% of the U.S. population live within 600 miles of Cleveland. Seven, uh, like 210 million people live in this part of the country. Most of the people live over here. Think about this, how many people live in Wyoming? How many people live in North Dakota or South Dakota, like seven, I guess? You know, I mean, how many people live in those, in those, in those, in those states? You know, they have more cows, you know, than people. You know, some of these states, like Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, they have a population of 400,000, 500,000, which is even smaller than the city of, you know, let's say of Chattanooga. So things have not changed. So most of the people came over here. So then when the banks were created in 1913, we create the Federal Reserve Banking System. It's a system of banks that they actually act, they have autonomy, but they actually act in conjunction to try to help the economy to deal with monetary policy. So remember this. When the bank was first created, it has a very simple, be simple, easy beginning, a very humble beginning. And the beginning of the Federal Reserve Bank was simply nothing more than a bank that was going to help banks in case of need to facilitate the exchange of payments. Now, throughout the years, for the last 100 years, this system, the Federal Reserve Banking System, has actually developed, developed. It has become the most powerful agency of the United States. So today, the United States Federal Reserve Banking System is the most powerful agency that the government has. It has the power to create money, it has the power to make an economy to function good, and it has the power to destroy an economy. Right? The most, to me, this is the most powerful agency that we have in the United States government. And I'm going to try to explain to this how this works, okay? So, let me go now into the chapter. And we are trying to understand the Federal Reserve System. Okay. The bank was created in 1913, as I mentioned to you. It is made of 12 banks. And each bank acts as a central bank for private banks. In other words, for example, all the banks in region number six, in the region of Atlanta, if they have a need or a problem, they communicate with that bank. So, if for example, if I am, uh, let me see right here. For example, let's assume that, you know, uh, a friend of mine sends me a check, you know, a payment for something, and he, these people is located in Boston. So he sent me the check to me, and I take my check to the bank in Cleveland. The bank in Cleveland is going to give me that payment, it's gonna give me that money, then the Bank of Cleveland will send that check to the Bank of Atlanta, that's in that region, and the Bank of Atlanta will give credit to the Bank of Cleveland, then the Bank of Atlanta will be in contact with the Bank of Boston, the Bank of Boston will give credit to the Bank of Atlanta, then the Bank of Boston will contact the bank from which this check was issued and will debit the amount from that bank, and then that bank will debit the amount from the actual individual that owns the account. 
So as you can see, this is what the Federal Reserve Bank actually does. It facilitates transactions. So you don't have to go directly to the bank. You just go to the bank in which you operate it. I'm talking about a bank. The bank only has to go there, okay? So coming back to this then, uh, hold on for a second. This is a wrong chapter. Uh, so the structure of the Federal Reserve Bank, as you can see, it was created in 1913. It's made of 12 banks. They serve as a central bank for those banks in that region. What do they do? They clear checks, they hold bank reserves, and they provide currency. Remember what I told you in the last chapter? Uh, if I go to the bank and I deposit money, by law, the bank has to keep a required reserve. Well, sometimes it's very expensive for banks to build a vault to put the money. So then what banks do, they actually transfer the money to the bank in which they are located. So then the Bank of Atlanta, if one day you have time or whatever you live, right, go to the Federal Reserve Bank and Federal Reserve Banks have a tour to the bank and you can go and see what they actually do. And in many cases, they actually take you to the warehouse. And the warehouse is the vault where they store all the money of all the banks in that region. For example, I have been to the vault in uh, the Bank of Atlanta and on a typical day, they have about $800 million in cash. Right? I mean, you go there and they have it just in big, almost like, a, you know, uh, what's it called, uh, pallets. They have the money in pallets, right? And that's what they do. So then, for example, if a bank needs money, a bank can actually borrow money from the Fed, right? So again, they clear checks, they hold bank reserves, and they provide currency. Think about this, for example, let's say Zach, you know, has a thousand dollars on his local bank in Cleveland, and then one day he become addictive to, I don't know, vending machines. You know, he wants all his $1,000 in quarters. So Zach will go to his bank and say, I want $1,000 in quarters. Well, the bank probably does not have $1,000 in quarters. But the bank will say, okay, no problem. Let me find the money for you. A bank will contact other banks in that region and say, hey, I have a crazy guy here that wants $1,000 in quarters. Right? And they all have, he wants new quarters because you can actually ask that. I want new bills. Right? And, and the bank will say, well, I don't have it. Then the bank can actually contact the bank of Atlanta and the bank of Atlanta say, we have this bank that wants a thousand dollars in new quarters. If the bank does not have it, then the bank will contact the Mint and the Mint will print brand new quarters just for SAC so he can be happy. So that's what the banks do, okay? So they provide currency, okay? And the Fed also provide loans. Now, the Fed provide loans not to individuals. The Fed provide loans to banks, to banks. Think about, for example, if a company in, let's say, in Cleveland, you know, a construction company has, let's say, $10 million at the local bank for a big project. And then the company decides to move, let's say, to Boston. And they want to transfer the money that they have to another bank in Boston to operate over there. Well, chances are the Bank of Cleveland has already lent that money to someone else in loans. Well, the Bank of Cleveland would call the Bank of Atlanta and say, I need a loan for $10 million so I can pay these guys deposits. So that's what the bank will do, okay? So the Federal Bank make loans to banks. Now, these 12 banks are regulated by a board of governors, by a board of governors. Now, the board of governors is 12 individuals appointed by the President of the United States, and these individuals have to be uh, cleared by the Senate. Okay, there are 12 individuals appointed by the President of the United States, and all these 12 individuals have to be approved by the Senate. And these guys become the members of the Board of Governors. Again, the Board, of, uh, the board members, once they are appointed, they serve for 14 years. They are appointed for 14 years. So every two years, one of the members' time expires, and then the president can appoint another individual. You can only serve one time during your lifetime. You know, it's a, an appointment of 14 years. And the idea is this, that once I appoint someone into this board of governors, these board of governors don't have to be concerned about losing their jobs or me, the president, being upset with them and try to fire them. The president of the United States do not have the power to fire the board of governors. The board of governors have the autonomy to make monetary decisions without the influence of the government. Remember what I told you? That it's a very powerful agency. It's a very powerful agency. And those individuals don't have to worry about what you think, or what, what I think, or what the government thinks. They make their own decisions. Now, the responsibility is to try to help the economy to achieve macroeconomic goals. 
you know, remember the, the uh, economic growth, price stability, and full employment. So by changing the amount of money in the economy, they can actually achieve those goals, okay? So again, this is the Board of Governors. So then what we're saying is this. Let me come here. So then the 12 banks are actually managed by the Board of Governors, right? By the Board of Governors. Now, in each bank, let's say, for example, as you already know, the nation is divided into geographical areas. Let's say region number six, region number six, that is actually uh, Georgia, parts of Alabama, Florida, and I don't remember what the other ones, was a big region, right? Now, the Bank of Georgia, the Bank of Atlanta, looks at all the economic activity that is taking place in that region. I mean, I have been there many, many times, you know, and I know how they operate. For example, in the Bank of Atlanta, they have about 400 individuals, young people like you, that they're actually working under the direction of very bright individuals. We have PhDs in economics and finance, and these individuals are responsible for looking about all economic activity in that region. For example, in region number six, we have divided the region into 21 industries. We're looking at the banking industry, the housing industry, the communications industry, the retail industry, the agriculture industry, and so on. So what they do, they appoint a group of about 20 individuals in, like you that have a college degree in business or finance, right? And together with the individuals have master's degree and somebody have PhD, they look at that, that industry and they collect all the information. For example, at the auto industry, they look at, for example, how many cars were made in this region? What is the average number of times a car stay in the lot? What is the average price? What's the number of people unemployed in that industry, blah, blah, blah. So they collect all the information in that industry. So then they collect the information of all what is happening. And based on that, they get a, a picture of what's going on in that, in that region. Like, are people being hurt? Are people okay? Are people working? Are people unemployed? Are people have money in their accounts and things like that? So all the 12 banks collect that information and they send it to Washington, D.C. And in Washington, D.C., that's where the Board of Governors, right, actually meet to figure out what do we need to do with the economy, right? Now, each bank has their own uh, directors, and the directors summarize what's going on, right? And then the information is sent to Washington, D.C., and then these individuals decide to figure out what do they need to do with the economy. They get a picture of, for example, high levels of unemployment in California. Probably we need to stimulate the economy there, right? And we can do that by monetary policy. Now, think about this. Look. In the nation, here in Washington, D.C., we have the Congress of the United States. The Congress of the United States is in charge of fiscal policy. The fiscal policy is under the Congress. Monetary policy is under the Federal Reserve Bank, right? Now, for example, let's assume that for some reason, the economy is going into a recession. The economy is going to a recession, and Congress decides to push a lot of money into the economy they push a lot of money into the economy. So now we have a lot of money into the economy. Everybody has money, everybody has money, right? So then the Federal Reserve Bank can actually say, hey, I don't like what's going on in the economy and I can actually counter the activities that is taking place. So in other words, Congress and the Federal Reserve Bank don't have to agree on what they need to do. Sometimes they work together, but they don't have to. They don't have to. For example, think about, for example, fiscal policy today, the government is spending $3 trillion. Where did they get that money from? They got that money by selling bonds, right? They're selling bonds. So a lot of individuals over here now have lent money to the government. They have a lot of bonds. Now the question is, what can you do with bonds? Nothing. You cannot go to the store and buy. It's just a piece of paper. It's an IOU. So then the Federal Reserve Bank can say, you know, I need to put money into the economy. I need to put money into the economy. So they have a couple of tools to increase the amount of money in the economy. The tools is, number one, changing the required reserves. So then by lowering the required reserves, by lowering the required reserves, 
then the banks will be able to lend more money. So as you can see, we're putting more money into the economy. Another tool that they have, which is the most powerful, is open market operations. And open market operations is that they have the power to buy bonds. They have to, the power to buy or sell bonds that have been previously issued by Congress. So then the, the Federal Reserve Bank, the Federal Reserve Bank can come and say to this guy right here, this guy purchased a US government bond that is due, let's say, in the year 2018. The Federal Reserve Bank say, hey, you don't need to wait to 20, well, it's more than 2018. Where are we now? 20, <laughs> we're already in 2020, right? Uh, yeah, 2028. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this bond is due in 2028. The bank would come to this guy and say, you don't have to wait for that. I'll buy the bond from you. So then the Fed buys the bond from this guy and automatically deposit his money or this money on his account. So that once the Fed buys the bonds from individuals, that money is directly deposited in the individual's bank. So for the bank, it's a new deposit they have received, and then the banks will be able to now start making loans. Okay? So again, we're trying to understand the power of the Federal Reserve Bank and how they actually work. Okay? So, so again, from the structure of the Fed is the 12 individuals together with the other bank's presidents, they create a committee called the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, okay? So let me come right here. Okay. We have the 12 Board of Governors. And then here we have the 12 individual banks, right? So then these presidents and the 12, they meet in Washington, DC, right? And they are responsible for monetary policy. They have a committee called the FOMC. And the FOMC is made out of the 12 Board of Governors plus five presidents or the 12 banks, they select who's going to be there, right? So it's the 12 plus five. By the way, one of these have to be the president of the Bank of New York City at all times. So I guess the right way to say it is like this. We have the 12 Board of Governors, the president of the Bank of New York City, and four of the other presidents, right? So then these guys are responsible for monetary policy. They sit down and they say, do we need to increase the amount of money in the economy? or do we need to decrease the amount of money in the economy? Okay. So again, the FOMC is responsible for the decision of what they're going to do in the economy. And they meet every month and then they decide if they need to increase or decrease the amount of money in the economy. Okay. Now, what is the tools of monetary policy? How does the Fed controls the amount of money in the economy? Okay, the way the government controls the amount of money in the economy is in the following way. They have three tools of monetary policy. The three tools of monetary policy is, uh, hold on right here, changing the reserve requirement. In other words, if we want to have more money in the economy, what do we do? we lower the required reserves. The second tool is changing the discount rate. Now, what is the discount rate? The discount rate is the interest rate. Uh, hold on. Uh, okay, yeah, the discount rate is the interest rate that a bank has to pay to the Federal Reserve Bank if they want to borrow money. Okay. Let me explain how this works. The Bank of Cleveland has this guy that decides to withdraw his money. Remember what I told you about the guy moved to Boston and they are short $10 million. The Bank of Cleveland can contact banks near to them, like a Bank of Chattanooga or the Bank of Knoxville and say, can you make me a short-term loan so I can give this guy his money? So that a bank can borrow from another bank or a bank can borrow money straight from the Federal Reserve Banking System. 
So then when a bank borrow money from the system, we say that this bank is borrowing money from the discount window and the interest rate he is going to pay is called the discount rate. So then think about this. If the Fed lowers the discount rate, then banks are going to be more inclined to borrow money to be able to make more loans. So we want to ease monetary policy. We want to put more money into the economy. We lower the reserve requirements. And then we lower also the discount rates, right? And the discount rates, again, is the interest rate that a bank is going to have to pay to the system if they want to borrow money. Now, the discount rate is also the benchmark by which all interest rates are set. It's the benchmark. So every time the Fed lowers the discount rate, all interest rates in the economy actually decrease. So then when interest rate decrease, people are more inclined to borrow money, to make consumption. So if we want people to buy, we want to give them more money. So how do we do it in fiscal policy? How do we increase money in fiscal policy? By increasing transfer payments or by decreasing taxes? So now we have people have more money they're going to be able to buy. But we can also do it by monetary policy. We lower the required reserves. Now bank has more money to lend and we lower the discount rate, right? So which means that we lower all interest rates. With the most powerful tool of monetary policy, is open market operations. And what is open market operations? Buying or selling previously issued securities. Think about this. How does the Congress United States raise its money? Well, by taxes or by borrowing. The government revenue comes by taxes or by borrowing. How does the government borrow money? Well, the government borrows money by selling little pieces of paper. IOUs, bonds, government bonds. A bond is a piece of paper that the government simply say, I'm going to give you your money in the future. So then when individuals buy bonds or when individuals lend money to the government, what individuals have now is a piece of paper that simply say, this guy is going to get paid X amount of money in the future. There's nothing you can do with this piece of paper. There's nothing you can do. You cannot go buy. Right? So then, if individuals have a lot of bonds in the economy, that means that people do not have a lot of cash because they lend the money to the government. The government already spent this money. I don't know. The government went out and made a bomb to, you know, to go and bomb Iraq. I don't know. The money is already spent. It. So the Fed can come into the economy and say, I want to put, put more money into the economy. So what they do, they come to individuals and say, hey, I'll buy the bonds. You don't have to wait. So then by buying bonds, individuals automatically get their money now, and now either they're going to spend it or put it at the bank. It doesn't really matter. The money comes into the economy. Now, think about this then. If we want to constrain the amount of money in the economy, what do we do? If we want to constrain the amount of money in the economy, what do we do? We increase the reserve requirements. We increase the discount rate. And we sell bonds but so by selling bonds we're putting worthless pieces of paper that you cannot use to do business and we take cash out of the economy on the other hand if we want to increase the amount of money in the economy we lower the requirements we lower the discount rate and we buy government securities okay so this is this is the yeah. So this is more or less the way the Fed actually controls the amount of money in the economy. Okay. So again, what are the tools of monetary policy? Changes in the required reserve ratio, changes in the discount rate, and open market operations. What is open market operations? The buying and selling of U.S. bonds. Yeah, buying or selling government bonds. Okay. So as you can see, then the Congress and the Federal Reserve Banking System 
They try to work together, but they don't have to. They try to work together to try to stimulate the economy. So for example, think about what is happening today. Fiscal policy. The government increased transfer payments. Remember the check, the stimulus checks? They lowered taxes, right? And they increased government purchases. We want to stimulate the economy. At the same time, the Federal Reserve Bank have lowered the discount rate, have lowered the required reserves, and the Federal Reserve Bank is actually now heavily, heavily, heavily involved in open market operations, buying a lot of bonds. Right? I think they have purchased like a trillion dollars worth of bonds. In other words, they have put about a trillion dollars worth of money in the checking accounts or savings accounts of many individuals, which now the banks have all these excess reserves that they're desperately trying to lend to someone else. Right? So remember this, guys, one day in the future, when you go to the bank to borrow money, the bank is not making you a favor by lending you money. And many people, when they go to the bank, to me, it's kind of interesting. Many people put their back closed and say, oh, I hope they give me the loan. I hope they give me the loan. Oh, I hope they give me the loan. The bank is not making you a favor by giving you a loan. You're actually doing them a favor by going to them to ask for a loan. So next time, do like I do every time I go to a bank. I say, hey, by the way, this is the amount of money that I need. And this is the interest rate that I know I can get it from this other bank. If you can match it, I'll get the money from you. If not, don't worry about it. So now right away, they know that, okay, this guy has other options. Well, you don't even have to say, you simply say, hey, I know that I can get this loan from this bank because this is how much they advertise him. So I need a loan. So you actually doing a favor to them. And today, banks are desperately, desperately trying to make loans because they have so much money and they don't know what to do with it, okay? So again, this is monetary policy. Uh, and this is the end of the chapter. There's only like two more slides that we need to cover, but we can wait to cover them tomorrow, okay? So we have finished chapter 14 too, okay? So 